Let's take a look at the joints of the axial skeleton. Working our way up from the lower extremity, we encounter two joints of the pelvis, the sacroiliac or SI joint and the pubic symphysis. The SI joint is a complicated joint. Anteriorly, it is an atypical synovial joint. Posteriorly, it is a syndesmotic joint. As the name implies, the pubic symphysis is a symphysis. The joints of the pelvis have two functions. First, they will transmit forces from the torso to the legs and from the legs to the torso. Now, you might be thinking that one solid bone would be better able to do that than three bones and two joints. So why do we have those two joints? They allow the pelvic bone to twist as the leg flexes and extends. So there is a small amount of movement at these joints. These small movements allow torsional stresses in the pelvic rim to dissipate. If it wasn't for these movements, the pelvic bones would probably be susceptible to stress fractures. Now let's take a look at the vertebral column. The basis of movement is the functional spinal unit. The functional spinal unit consists of two vertebra and the disc in between them. The name of the functional spinal unit is based on the vertebra that make it up, and it is usually designated by a letter for that region and then the numbers of that vertebra. For example, the functional spinal unit L4, L5 is made up of the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebra. As you can see in the diagram, the functional spinal unit is made up of three joints. The inner body joint, which is a symphysis, and the right and left zygopophyseal joints, which are planar gliding joints. The zygopophyseal joints are often referred to as facet joints. The motion at any one functional spinal unit is small. Where the motion of the spine comes from is adding all of the small individual movements in that region together. Since the inner body joints are largely the same throughout the spine, regional differences in spinal mobility is attributed to the facet joints, whose orientations are different in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar regions. Let's take a look at the disc a little more closely. The disc is made up of two parts. The outer section is called the annulus fibrosus, and it provides structure to the disc. The nucleus propulsus is like jelly inside a jelly donut. It serves the same function as putting air in your tires. This pressurizes the disc and allows the vertebral bodies to move without impinging on one another. The functional spinal unit will allow motion in all three planes. The axes all coincide with the superior aspect of the inferior vertebral body. Flexion extension in the sagittal plane is about a medial lateral axis. Lateral flexion in the frontal plane is about an anterior posterior axis. And rotation in the transverse plane is about a longitudinal axis. So that's what happens at the functional spinal unit level. As I mentioned earlier, spinal motion is really the sum of the functional spinal units in that region. For this class, we are going to break the spine up into two regions. The first region is composed of the thoracic and lumbar vertebra. Motions in the thoracal lumbar region include flexion, extension, lateral bending or lateral flexion, and rotation. The second region is composed of the cervical region and its articulation with the skull. Motions in the craniocervical region include flexion, extension, lateral bending or lateral flexion, and rotation. Now let's look at some of these movements a little bit more dynamically. So if we look at movements that are occurring in the sagittal plane, we can see that we have flexion and extension of the lumbar spine. If I rotate here around, you can see we also have lateral bending. Now when we talk about spinal motions, spinal motions are always in regards to how the upper vertebra in that functional spinal unit is moving in relation to that lower vertebra in the functional spinal unit. So if I look here, this would be lateral bending right, or right lateral bending, or right lateral flexion, and this would be left lateral bending, or left lateral flexion. Okay. Now let's look at rotation in a transverse plane. So again, everything is always in reference to the superior vertebra moving on the inferior vertebra. So if we look here, we are going to have rotation left. If we go here, we'll have rotation right. So rotation left and rotation right. 
Now my model here does not have any craniocervical motion, nor is it going to be able to demonstrate having the inferior portion of the vertebra moving on the superior portion of the vertebra. So that's something that I'll be asking you to do as part of the group discussions, and we can talk more about that in the clarifying lectures.